All right, I'm gonna start on time because I have exactly 23 minutes of slides for a 25 minute session. So if afterwards you want to have questions, uh, I will stick around through the next session which is also a code of conduct session. Uh, and then afterwards we can have more conversation. Uh, if you wanna find me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handles are up there. So hi, I'm Sage Sharp. Uh, I am I have my own company called Otter Tech where I do diversity and inclusion consulting and I'm also have been an open source developer for 10 years. And so through my work with Otter Tech and being in the open source community for a very long time, I've watched a lot of communities adopt a code of conduct. And it's usually because in reaction to some event that happens either in their community or in another community. Um, maybe they get trolls that come and maybe they get spammers. Maybe they have someone that submits Bitcoin mining code to their CI system. <laughs> And so they want to try to make sure to tell the trolls, no, this is a welcoming place. You don't belong here. Um, there are also a lot of communities that feel pressured to adopt a code of conduct um, because of all the other communities are doing it. Why shouldn't my community do it? Um, it's insert current year. Why don't you have a code of conduct? Um, some communities adopt a code of conduct because someone table flips. Uh, they go public about the harassment or abuse that they face, and sometimes that means that customers decide not to use particular products or software or get involved in communities. And so it's important that, if you, that these communities come and they have a code of conduct because of these reactionary events. A lot of them don't necessarily have a plan for how to enforce the code of conduct, how to um, try to make their, their communities a more welcoming place. So what I like to do is I like to try to ask um, the people that I'm doing consulting with three fairly simple questions, but they get complex really fast. And these are folks that are trying to adopt a code of conduct, maybe they're uh, doing a code of conduct review, modifying it, uh, or trying to get advice on putting together a plan for uh, how to do code of conduct enforcement. So I asked them three fairly simple questions that uh, get complex fairly fast. The first one is why? Not why is your community adopting a code of conduct? Uh, why, not why your community leaders are adopting code of conduct, but why do your customers, why do your community members, and why does even your boss want you to adopt a code of conduct? And the second question is who? Who is going to enforce your code of conduct and how? How are they going to enforce it? So let's dig a little deeper into the question of why. Why should you have a code of conduct besides these sorts of reactionary events occurring? Um, and it actually turns out that McKinsey has done a study of companies. And what they did was they ranked companies based on their gender diversity. And what they found was that companies that were in the highest quartile for gender diversity were actually 15% more likely to financially outperform companies that were in the lowest quartile. So having a diverse gender perspective really helps companies. And when you look at rage, uh, race and ethnicity, then that e becomes even more likely to financially outperform your competitors. But it's not just enough to bring in diverse voices you need to make sure that they're also heard and listened to and respected and can get into leadership positions. And in order for that to happen, sometimes culture needs to change and sometimes we have to address biases that we have. So there was a study of uh, GitHub and in tech, we really cling to this notion that tech is a meritocracy. We submit code, people review code and it's, it should be equal um, as long as you can speak English well. Uh, but in this particular study, what they found was they looked at people's GitHub's profiles and they looked at the email address. And if it was a Gmail address, they did a query out to the Google Plus API and said, 
Google, what gender does this person say they are? Which is ethically, ethically kind of morally weird, but Google said, hey, this is what the terms of service say we can do. Uh, and so the researchers were like, well, okay, we'll do this. And so what they found through this research was that if you were, if your Google Plus profile was marked as female, if you were a woman, um, then you were more likely to get your pull request accepted, but only if your username and your profile were not feminine. If someone could identify you as a woman, you were actually more likely to get more comments on your pull requests, more pushback, and less likely to be able to get it merged. So even though we like to think that tech is a meritocracy, it's not. There's still bias and it still exists. And sometimes what happens is that bias is often in some of our, our um, developers who have been around for a long time. And it's really hard to try to go and have conversations with them about correcting that bias um, because you don't want to lose them necessarily, right? They're, they're really important to your community. They've been around for a while. They do a lot of work. But there's another study that shows, and it looked particularly at churn within companies. And they said, okay, so these, these developers that are, are toxic but they're great, you know, how much do they add to the bottom line? And it turns out that, it's that they actually add less to the bottom line of the company than uh, the company has to pay in the people who leave and the bonuses for the people they have to hire for, that have left because of toxic workers. So if you relate this to developer communities, sure, maybe these toxic folks are doing a lot of work, but they're also causing a lot of churn. They're causing a lot of work for people who are trying to welcome newcomers and get them in and um, get people into more leadership positions or they're causing more churn there. So something to think about. Another thing too is that this is not just related to smaller companies. So Google did a study and they wanted to figure out what was um, the, the most indicator of success for t teams. They looked at education, they looked at mix of technical versus non-technical folks, they looked at age, they looked at all sorts of demographics. And what they found was the most productive teams at Google were the ones where people felt listened to and respected. Which brings us back to your code of conduct. If your code of conduct says, we value your perspective, we want you here, we want to respect you and listen to, but your code of conduct isn't enforced, your code of conduct is an empty promise. If you say, we want to make this a safe community for all, for all people to feel welcome, but you don't actually know how to enforce your code of conduct or you don't have a plan, this is an empty promise. And so the next couple of questions are, how do we live up to the things that we put in our code of conduct to try to make sure that we have a safe and welcoming environment for everyone? So the first question is who? Who is going to enforce your code of conduct? Because you need a team put together and hopefully you don't put that team together after an incident occurs. Because you will get flack because it takes a while to, to put it together. And hopefully that team reflects the different perspectives that you want to promote, the, the values that you've put into your code of conduct. It's not good to continually ask people who are from groups underrepresented in tech to always do the work, but you want to make sure that they have input and they have a seat at the table if they'd like it. Another thing to note is that your code of conduct enforcement team needs to be available around the clock because if uh, something happens at 3 a.m. on the West Coast and no one's around, uh, you still need to be able to um, address that issue. If you're running events, you need to decide you know, how far does the code of conduct extend? Do they extend to evening events? And if so, do you have enough people around who can actually be at the events to actually take a report um, and, and make sure that they're sober as well to take the report? 
Um, it's useful to be able to physically identify people who um, have gone through code of conduct incident response training and know how to take a report because not every staff person, especially at a really big conference or even a medium-sized conference, is going to know how to take a report. So having something physical like a shirt or hat or whatever to try to identify them is very useful. It's also useful to... Um, have the contact information for the code of conduct reporters, so either um, a, a phone number or an email address um, or even an anonymous form where people can report because sometimes people don't feel comfortable uh, reporting, I, I, associating themselves with the report because there's a lot of uh, reputation hit that they may take if they make a report. Um, and in this particular example, it's really good because it identifies the person who is behind um, the, the code of conduct email address. I've seen a lot of code of conducts where it's just abuse at whatever, info at whatever. That doesn't tell me who's behind it. And if I have um, an issue with an organizer, I'm not sure if they're gonna be the one that's gonna get the email from me. So listing the individual people who are on your code of conduct team both gives me the confidence that there's someone behind that email and also allows me to individually contact folks uh, if there's a problem, because your, your code of conduct team might slip up. Another thing to think about is not just newcomers or trolls coming into your community and having a code of conduct violation, but how would you handle it if a key developer had a code of conduct violation and you had to ban them? What if they can force push to your repository? What if they have access to your server? What if they have access to your mail server? What if they have access to your chat logs? So it's important to think about what would happen if someone with the keys to the community actually had an incident occur. It's also important to think about within your code of conduct um, incident response team, what happens when there's a conflict of interest? Because um, if there's a conflict of interest, then sometimes people need to recluse themselves and the other, part, other members of the team will figure out the situation. Um, if you have documentation of your code of conduct violations, it's very important to plan for these conflicts of interest. So if you're using something like Google Docs or other things, allowing um, individual file permissions so that only certain people have access to it is very useful. However, do note that uh, link sharing, turning that on, means that anyone who has the link can go find it. Um, also note that sometimes you have meta information about a file, so someone can look at when was the last time it was modified. Oh, they must have met last night to talk about this. Um, they can dig through the comments and figure out who was advocating for what. And so it's very important to think about what kinds of meta information people can find. So let's talk a little bit about the how. How do you enforce a code of conduct? Um, and I really want to thank um, Audrey Eshright of Safety First PDX. She developed this particular framework for putting code of conduct violations into this framework. So the framework is basically risk versus impact. So how risky is the situation? How harmful could it be? And, and taking into account also like mental health, uh, physical health, financial resources, that sort of thing. And then the second framework is impact. Does it impact one person? Does it impact multiple people? So if someone has um, says a sexist joke in a private conversation, then that would be a low risk, low impact situation. With the caveat, of course, that whisper network ex exists. People talk to each other, and if you badly handle a code of conduct issue, then people will find out about it. So when you're thinking about impact, think not just about is it the one person, but also what would happen if a whole bunch of people heard about it. Um, and so you can basically use this framework to think about what sort of um, response you would have to an incident. So if it's something like a joke in a conversation, maybe you would issue a warning. You would say something like, you know, this, we want to make sure that our conference is inclusive and I just wanted to let you know that that term is problematic. Here's some other terms you could use instead. 
Um, if someone is having issues with um, maybe they're acting out online in your community, maybe they're just grumpy at everyone, maybe you could just say, hey, let's have a time, time out. Just, can you just take a break from um, your, your particular community for just a while and, and you know, go try to deal with some of the burnout that you, I can see you're having? Um, if it's something like an interpersonal conflict um, that's starting to go into the more riskier areas, um, maybe you want to offer someone um, to walk them back to their hotel. Maybe you can say to the person, like, don't contact this person. It's fine if you're at the event, but if you contact them, then we will remove you. Um, if it's something more high impact, like someone made a joke in a presentation, you might need to issue a public apology. Um, you may need to ask someone not to come back. Um, if it's something like someone brings a weapon to a conference, then that starts to get into the more high impact, high risk situation where you're like, no, you really need to leave the conference and we will involve building security if you don't leave and put your concealed carry away and then come back. Um, if it starts to get into a situation like harassment, stalking, doxing, that's really when you need to have a very quick response and have everyone involved to have a coordinated response fast. But there's still some complexities when you think about code of conduct. And one of them is where does the code of conduct end and begin? Where are the boundaries of your communities? If it's an event like DrupalCon, then it's you know, the conference space, it's the evening events, but then what happens if someone's out drinking after the events and something problematic happens? Um, on online spaces, it gets complicated as well. You might say, well, it applies to our, our Slack channel, it applies to the GitHub repo and the issue tracker, uh, but then what happens when someone's giving a talk if they're representing your community at another conference? and something happens. And so the borders of your community are something that you need to talk about when you're thinking about how to enforce a code of conduct. It's also important to think about what would happen if an incident occurred in another open source community, maybe a related one, maybe it's a tool that your community builds on, um, and the person is involved in both communities. And in that case, would you uh, preemptively say, no, you're not welcome in our community as well, or would you just say, well, it doesn't really apply because our code of conduct doesn't really apply to that community. It really depends. It's something you need to think about. Another complex issue is interpersonal violence between folks, because interpersonal violence is usually between people you know, and so the likelihood of it happening between community members is something that may happen. And so you need to ha think about how you would deal with someone coming to you with an issue of domestic violence, uh, interpersonal abuse, and how you would deal with that situation. Um, there are a lot of issues and a lot of uh, conferences recently have had issues with not necessarily handling it well, not notifying people in advance. And so it's, it's something I would encourage folks to think about how they would handle before they have to decide which friend to believe. The other thing to think about is um, whether you just take into the behavior in your community or you look at the larger picture. So especially in cases like online harassment, stalking, doxing, um, it may or may not happen all in your community. It's often spread across multiple social medias, emails, blog comments. And so you need to think about, do you take into account this pattern of unwanted contact? Or do you just look at the borderline behavior within your community? All very complex questions. So we started out with three really simple questions. Why do you, does your customers and your boss and your community members want you to have a good enforced code of conduct? Who is going to enforce your code of conduct and how you're going to enforce it? So as I said, very simple questions and they get complicated really, really fast. 
Um, there's some resources that I've put on this slide, uh, including some from my company, from other uh, diversity and inclusion folks that do that. And so, um, as I said, it's pretty short. Uh, we have about six minutes if someone had like one or two questions. Hi, thanks for that. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to define the boundaries of community in specifically in governance conversations where we talk about how do we govern technological or less technological conversations? Um, what keeps coming up is like, well, where does the community start and stop? Yeah, I, and I think it's a difficult question because if someone's, for example, if someone's Twitter account is 90% Drupal, right? There's some, or they're a leader and a bunch of Drupal people follow them, then it's a difficult boundary of where that is. But at the same time, you need to, it's, it's difficult because you need to m make sure that people can have a private life, right? So I don't know, for, for me, it really depends on the person. If they are seen as a leader, and the question you have to ask yourself is, would we want the rest of our community members to emulate that behavior? Because there's a lot of communities that have not so great behavior from the leaders. And then that means that the rest of the community is not so great, despite all of the work of, of some people trying to make a difference. So. Okay, it's me again. <laughs> Hello again. Hi. Um, can't, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, do you have any thoughts then on how communities can define who is in leadership? Because mm. we move in and out of it. Um, even within the same community, right? I'm a leader over there, but I'm not here. Um, yeah. Defining a leader. Oh, that sounds like a really broad question. Um, so I'm going to give a really broad, broad answer back. <laughs> I mean, uh, so there's different kinds of leadership, right? You need to acknowledge that there's both technical and non-technical leadership. So there's people who run events. There's people who do code. There's people who write documentation. All of these can be leaders, right? Um, and sometimes people can be quiet leaders. They don't necessarily have to have a really huge following to still have impact on the project. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm gonna leave that. It's really broad, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, if you wanna make like an official term, I mean, there are some communities that have very specific leadership positions, right? There's like, for example, the not mm, there's like the Mozilla Reps program, right, where they have official sort of things, but not every community has that. Is there a shy question back there? <laughs> I won't bite. I promise. <laughs> We'll end early then. If you have more questions, I will be sticking around. Thank you. Okay, it's recorded, right? Yeah, yeah. so they're going to get an email from you. Watch this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I look with you. <laughs> so I added the like, community combo code of conduct buffer space because uh, I thought all maybe of they'd be here. Would <laughs> <laughs> you should just like invite them over for a movie night and then just be like, here, we're going to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes.
with the people who will get the will be passionately upset don't necessarily like to engage in the preamble or in the comps. They that they are they have the passion and the energy, um, but they're not actually interested in the longer run conversation. And that makes it hard to figure out how to have a productive conversation because you do need people who are varieties of opinion, uh, but not everybody likes to show up in equal numbers. I mean, it's one of the things. Yeah, and I think because it's fun. Finding the balance, because I think it's yeah. it's not necessarily that we're past it, but there are no, some no, no. people who. Are, but I mean, there are some people who it's both are. It's not, it's not. Yeah, it, it's yeah. finding the mix. Because I think one of the challenges I've had a lot of the to go into the sessions from the allied position is a lot of times the sessions become really good problem statements. Yeah. I'm really good at the problem statement. Um, and like Nikki, you did the ally session last year, and, and yeah. like the ally session, the finding that place of like how do we get out of problem statement and into problem solving. Uh, it's
it's not that problem statement doesn't need to be restated. I mean, it isn't important, but it's not equally it, it's that it's not equally important to all parts of the audience at all times. And, and how do we make sure that there is that piece for where it's needed and people are getting it, um, but have a productive conversation about it? Great, I agree. There's a problem. How do I become part of the solution? Is much more interesting conversation to me mm -hmm. than rehearing problem statements. Yeah. I think there are, there are different parts of the larger audience that still need to hear the problem statement, and the yeah. people who have heard the problem statement and agree that it's a problem need to be in the room for the like, okay, where do we go from here thing? Yeah. And you know, right. uh, so there should be like the 101 talk followed by the 201. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The challenge yeah. is presenting, like having the session title and whatever else be something that the people who need to hear the problem statement don't think they don't need to hear. Because I, I, I'm right. certain that, exactly. you know, the, yeah. the, oh, why do we need a code of conduct people? Like there was no way they were going to come into this room based on the title of the talk. And that's, that's their fault. You know, like, not, but it's like, that, that's a, a problem that has as much to do with their attitude as, as anything else in terms of like marketing. Right. But well, there is you, a question there. Some of that is also that branding challenge of do you rename the thing yeah. or do you keep the branded identified thing yeah. and we try to expand the person? No, unfortunately. We try it every single last Yeah, Richie was very small. small. Yeah. I, I kind of um, share, share those worries with you. And I realize like I am not white and most of my audience and so like there's that. But I have been strongly pushed in a lot of being the ally and being present and yeah. and wanting to, to be in the space in part in case somebody comes in is recognizing that if there is somebody causing trouble, yeah. that it is, as the ally, part of my responsibility to step into that conflict uh, appropriately yeah. uh, and not just leave that on other people who uh, have to do that all the time. Uh, but then also, yeah, preserving that space and not, and not denying agency. I got this. There's no problem. I'll just mansplain my everybody's way out of it. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. 
honestly something meaningful I can contribute, I will try. But unless I'm absolutely certain that what I have to say is something no one else is going to be able to say, and, and you know, maybe, you know, sometimes like the other white guys in the room are only going to listen to the other white guy in the room because that's how, you know, that's how stuck they are. Ooh, maybe um, for a It's not something that women are saying men should be doing, but men saying yes, we should be doing it. And they kind of like it. But it is tricky to find the balance. I mean, it's always balance. It's just hard. I mean, I find like sometimes when I write my book, whether it's text chat or, I mean, anytime you see guys raising their voice and other voices mm -hmm. are silent.
can get your point across. I thought sometimes that's what you said. You know? People just go on without you. <laughs> Lucy, yeah. I like it better though in general. I'm also writing stuff that's a lot of kind of fun. <laughs> oh. They are. There is a bird's on the 